What is up, real estate investors? Brad here with another episode of TMC, which is not to be confused with TMZ. Oh, which is a whole different other selection of entertainment. Uh, yes, maybe more entertaining, but not as impactful. I hope. But also not to imply that we don't have our own little bit of funniness. Zipty do die around here. Yeah, zipty do da. That that's always been the way that I've been described. So. <laughs> That's fantastic. We've got my main guy here, Tony. If you don't know Tony, this is Tony. Morning. And uh, we are off of a three-day weekend. So what did you have going on this weekend? Well, we ran up to East Tennessee to the mountain. Okay. And a um, little village up there called Rugby we go to a lot. And um, and I, I pressure washed a deck. Oh, nice. I hadn't done that in a long time. I don't know if it pressure washed me or I pressure washed <laughs> it. But... I was tighter than the deck was. The deck felt better than I did when I was finished. So, how long did that take you? It took about two and a half hours. Yeah, it had not been touched in about twenty years. Wow! It actually had live algae growing on yeah. top of it. Is this this new house that you bought? Yeah, weeks ago? yeah. It's it's the carriage house deck. Um, okay, that's out there. It was actually that carriage house was built in eighteen eighty one also. Wow! And it originally held the carriage and the horse that pulled it. They didn't have vehicles up there then. Yeah. And um, and so it's been turned into a lovely loft apartment. And so we're renting it out to a lady. And uh, so I pressure washed her deck and got it ready. So yeah. It and, and Tony bought it with owner financing. Can you believe it? I've never heard of it. I understand. I bought both of those up there with 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 uh, subject to. Yeah. Yeah. So with owner financing in the, in the beginning and it, it gets you to a point, if you're going to Airbnb, it gets you to a point to where you can show a two or three year track record of that income. Right. Puts you in a whole different place if you're going to, going to finance it with a bank. Then, so. Yeah. It makes sense. Yeah. It makes sense. So my Memorial day consisted of, so generally what I like to do on Memorial day is do the Murph workout, which is a CrossFit workout. And, okay. uh, in memory of one of our fallen soldiers and then uh, cook out. Oh, and yeah. so I usually have some folk over and that kind of thing. Uh, Mason, my three-year-old was uh, a bit under the weather. And so we didn't want to expose everybody uh -huh. to that. So I did a 10 pound brisket and you know, it's me, my wife and two children. And my wife doesn't really like heavy, barbecue, heavy barbecue. Beef. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, she, she did her best. She might've might had three bites. And then my daughter, who's 40 pounds, we split a 10 pound brisket. So you can imagine we, we had a little bit left over, but uh, it didn't exactly go as planned, but little man's feeling better. So you're that. trying to tell me that James and I missed out on brisket because Mary Beth ate the other half. Yeah. That, it's all gone. <laughs> None of it remains. And so we have a, a very fat and happy little girl right now. <laughs> But uh, no, uh, you know, she's 40 pounds and she she probably had a couple more bites than mama did. She's dainty. Yeah, she's quite dainty. Yeah, very much so. So uh, but but we're headed to East Tennessee ourselves into the week. So yeah, when are you, when are you heading that way. Yeah. Yeah. Up to Gat it's Gatlinburg, right? Yeah. OK, that ought to be fun. Always good to see friends. Yeah. David Alexander and the crew. So David has his mastermind uh, twice a year, uh -huh. you know, usually summer and then winter. And uh, so we're going to be going up there. Uh, David the first gets, time I've been to his in a while. Yeah, it has been a while. Mm -hmm. I guess the last time was when we were in White House or something yeah, up there. Yeah, that old house. Up there. Yeah. And so uh, he gets two big cabins. One of them has an in, in, indoor pool. I know you like to swim. Oh, yeah. So he got the indoor pool. Uh, so he'll get two big cabins and there, there might be 30 or 40 of us up there. Okay. Uh, from all over the country. And, nice. You know, I was thinking today about, you know, just frankly how lucky I was to start under David. Uh -huh. You know, and I always try to pay tribute if I can. Um, you know, David created the sub three deal structure that we use and a, a lot of the deal structure that we use. And so um, I was thinking the other day, well, I think about it all the time out of the entire country of investors that that train at that time, uh, how lucky I was to start with him, because not only did he know how to navigate that market of 2010, but he was real, which is something you don't see a yeah. lot of, yeah. <laughs> you know. So I, I think all the time and I try to pay tribute, even though, you know, we've had people that have done 40 deals with us in one year uh -huh. you know, after really struggling. And then they go to teach something that I think after 40 transactions, you, you should know. Sort of, you know, <laughs> well, you, you definitely should know what you don't know. Uh, that's right. And after they started training people, 
uh, after doing 40 deals, they, they came to me and said, hey, how do we deposit an escrow check? Uh, oh, yeah. You remember that? Uh -huh. So, um, which, you know, I'm glad they're doing well. Uh, so we're excited about going to David's Mastermind. You know, he, he's also, like what you said, so much more. The so much more is the creative way that he sells. I mean, he has no boundaries. Yeah. He has no boundaries with anything. It is just, you know, and in the late nights when he gets a drawing on a whiteboard, it just, it's just crazy. And he'll go, oh, I could have done it this way. And he'll think of it while he's oh, yeah. midway training and he'll just start designing it. Well, give me a second. Let me design this out and see if this actually works. Yeah. So um, David started me when I was 23. And uh, I think my lucky stars every day that, that David did. But uh, so now we go to his events. He comes to our events. Great friend. Great friend. And uh, but I made a mistake my first in-person event in that I had him going right after me. So Tone started about 830. So we usually go 17 hour days whenever we have our events. So Tone started about 830. And he was just ba basically doing an introduction. I started at nine. I do State of the Union. So we want to take a snapshot of the real estate market, uh, talk about what we predicted last time and uh, what we're predicting now, you know, based on all data. So I watched this very, very closely. And David was going right after me. The problem is that David usually gets up about noon. <laughs> and so, and he had a very, very late night the <laughs> night before. And so I knew my material so late well. Late morning. Yeah. <laughs> I knew my material so well that uh, I was on my second to last slide and I'm talking, but in my mind, really what I'm thinking about is like, where's David? I don't see him. You know, where's David? And the door would open. I'd think here comes David, no David. And so I'm about to my last 30 seconds. And then I, I, I see the door open and here he comes. He has two Red Bulls yeah. in each hand. And I'm like, we're all saved. <laughs> so, <laughs> David with Red Bull is kind of like uh, uh, lighting a, a fuse to some fireworks and you don't know how long the fuse is. Uh, so like you just light it and you run away. Yeah. Uh, I heard somebody try to tell him they were concerned about how many Red Bulls he was drinking in a daytime, you know? Yeah. Well, that's. Yeah. 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 And he said, uh, his response was really, let's talk about your diet. <laughs> 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 let's discuss your diet. Do you know when you're leaving to go up there? I don't. I don't. I have no idea. All right. Cool. We'll, we'll talk about that. Okay. Uh, today we're talking about tired landlords. I've just been trying to get through this past weekend. Yeah, well, I understand. I understand. Mm. Yeah. Uh, today we're talking about tired landlords. This is the, uh, the finality of the Big Five series that we've been doing. So over the past, uh, I guess now with uh, Amanda jumping on in one week where uh, we couldn't make it work, Schedule-wise, uh, the past seven weeks, five of those weeks have been talking about the big five motivators that we see. And these really encompass probably 85% of our transactions. I used to really track it, and it is a very, very high percentage of our transactions come from these people that are one of these five big motivators. And so we're talking about tired landlords now uh, as a finality because we see that being a tired landlord is usually coupled with one of the other two. Uh, big motivators. So yeah. pre foreclosure and inheritance. So to talk about these specifically, um, a lot of times someone will sell a house or buy a house before they've sold their current house. And so they decide, well, I'll just rent it. You know, my debt to income ratio can substantiate both loans. And so they rent the house, but they don't understand what we call professional tenants. So a professional tenant is a tenant that is as good or better at understanding eviction law than your eviction term. And so they know how to, to turn the screws mm -hmm. and to, to do the, the song and dance to where they can stay in for an extended amount of time. And oftentimes these people don't really take care of the house. And so you have someone that was, was really relying on that incoming payment to pay the underlying loan on this rental. That incoming payment doesn't come in and either they can't get the person out or the person has already left, but the house is in like a, a serious need of repair. Mm -hmm. And the owner doesn't have the money. And so this is a big reason I want to get to, because that's one thing that we talked about, get to, we're not anti-rental. We're just very pro note. Yeah. You know, creating owner financing, partly because of this. So in my entire career, I've never had a foreclosure hurt me financially. It's always helped me because in general, that the market is appreciated. We got a down payment. That was a substantial down payment on the front end. And so that mitigates any, a whole lot of risk. I'm not going to say any risk 
a whole lot of risk of repair or damage that had been done by that person. Mm -hmm. Whereas with a rental, you don't have that. That's right. You know, and there's a big difference in having someone that wants to be an owner versus someone that's a tenant and is happy to be a tenant. Mm -hmm. So within that, uh, a lot of times the owner is needing that incoming payment to pay that loan and they can't do it. So now they're in pre foreclosure as well. Uh, the second situation, and I was almost this person, like we talked about inheritance last time, uh, I considered taking the house that I inherited and renting it, but I decided not to because of professional tenants. And we talked about my uh, grandmother's cabinets that she put on credit and right. nights to pay off because they didn't have yeah. cabinets when they built it. And um, I, I knew that that would upset me more than what is really fair or yeah. reasonable. And there's a difference between someone who buys a house they have no history with and they're going to rent it and someone who inherited a house that's a big yeah that's that a comes point. from family and that's a harder decision to make for sure for sure so a lot of times your tired landlord is also going to be really a prolonged inheritance lead. so they inherited the property some time ago maybe it was six months ago maybe it was years ago but there's still some emotion that's still tied with the, the precursors of being a tired landlord, which is inheritance or pre foreclosure. Mm -hmm. So it's really interesting. Um, it's, it's pretty rare that I see a tired landlord that doesn't have a precursor, you know, either inheritance or pre foreclosure. Mm -hmm. It does happen, mm -hmm. but it's, it's certainly an anomaly. And I would say that out of the big five, that tired landlords are, um, as a percentage, as a, a percentage of purpose, I can talk here in just a minute. Mm -hmm. A percentage of purchases, tired landlords are probably the, the lowest amount of purchases of the big five. Okay. But uh, that does not negate that they're very, very powerful, especially with term deals. Right. Okay? Um, it's the easiest to buy sub two from an inheritance situation or a pre foreclosure situation. So it's actually an anomaly if we don't buy sub two from those lead sources. With tired landlords, it's very easy for us to buy some now, some later, because that, that landlord is already used to interested it. in receiving payments. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, their whole tax structure, their whole, the way they receive income structure is probably already set up in receiving payments in their mind and on paper and even with their tax situation when they count it. And so receiving payments would be easier for them than. Uh, than getting a big lump sum right now and trying to figure out what to do with it. Yeah, hundred percent. And it's normal for them to receive payments, but there was also a time when they were excited and hoping to receive payments. Mm -hmm. They had this idea of, oh, I'm going to to be a landlord and receive these payments and get that mailbox money. <laughs> and they see pretty quickly that that mailbox money is not as easy as everybody made it out to be when mm -hmm. it comes to a rental. Mm -hmm. You know. And there's a big difference between holding a rental and holding a note. You know, one of the, the main benefits of holding paper as opposed to property is that you don't have vacancy and you don't have repair. And so um, as a landlord, you're all the time get, getting called with, well, the dishwasher doesn't work. I just mm -hmm. had this, this circuit trip. The HVAC isn't cooling upstairs. You know, those kinds of problems uh, where with the note, you don't have that. Mm -hmm. And you're always going to have turnover with a rental property. Whereas with a note, you really don't have that either. Now we have to foreclose at times that does happen, but it's a small percentage, very small percentage of the time. And so, um, and even, even when that happens, it's actually another profit center, although we don't like the idea of taking back property. And we try to do in-house refinances to keep people in property if we can. We've done that multiple times. Um, there are times whenever someone just literally will not pay, you know, and we've, we've had that happen. Yeah. Deer Lodge. Yeah, Deer Lodge. Well, one of our better deals from last year was from a foreclosure. You know, the guy owed me about 170,000, wouldn't pay it, and we sold it basically as is at 285. Yeah, I mean you were very giving, very kind to that that situation when you first owner financed the house to this couple. And then they made one payment and then they didn't make the next six. And um and so you said, look, why don't you just go out there and tell them, take that six, we'll put it on the back of the loan. They can start fresh from right now. So we did that. Then they didn't make the next six. And so even one more time, 
we said we'll do it if they'll we'll, we'll take those six and put them on the back of the loan because it was in a, it was at, in a location at the time that was not yeah. a desirable location part of the state that it was in and um and so i went back out and i said look you, but i'm gonna have to get six checks you're going to, have to write six checks he wrote me six checks right there on the spot and then the first two you know didn't go through i think uh, the first one did did and the next i think the first one the did, next two bounced the, the next two or whatever didn't go through and so we wound up foreclosing in the meantime what we didn't realize was that part of the state was going to become one of the more desirable parts of the state yeah. outside of large cities yeah and uh so then obviously it's over 285 yeah and and it worked out really really well this is a deal that shows the impact of understanding title at a high level because on this transaction there was a hundred and hundred or i can't remember exactly it was at least a hundred thousand dollars in irs lien that were set to pop off of title. So involuntary liens uh, as in a, like a judgment, um, generally depending on your state guys. So like check with your title company or closing attorney on this. But in Tennessee, the state where this one was, uh, judgments have a 10 year life on title. So at 10 years in one day, they pop off of title as if they don't exist on title. And at that point, um, once it expires, they can't reattach it because the, the title is transferred. That person no longer owns the house. So we had like a 50K first that we took sub two, a $100,000 second that we took mm -hmm. as an IRS lien sub two, and then that 100,000 vanished. So at that point we had 50K in first, 170 in second, which was our asset, the wrap, and uh, that we owned. So we had 120K in note equity, but then the guy wouldn't pay. And once it had appreciated, I mean, the guy literally could have sold it after he cleaned it up a little bit. We didn't do a rehab on this at all. Mm -hmm we cleaned it up he could have sold it and cleared a hundred thousand cash but because he made me foreclose on him right. you know that became ours in addition to the equity we already have mm -hmm. so all that to say we're not anti-landlord but we understand that for you to make the landlording model work you have to have cash and cash reserves you need to have some time to make it work and you need some experience and expertise when it comes to running that model mm -hmm. You know, and if you don't have these things, then it becomes extremely frustrating, mm -hmm. you know. And so let's talk about what the house means to the landlord, you know. So you think about the landlord. Generally, these are people that have some financial wherewithal, you know, or they wouldn't be landlords. And mm -hmm. of course, they could in, have inherited it. But either way, that is an asset that is convertible to some cash at that time in almost every circumstance. You know, and oftentimes they're free and clear properties. So you think about the mindset of the landlord and what they're hoping that property is. They're hoping that it's a generational asset. They're hoping that it becomes the mailbox money that uh, they see on TV. And they're hoping that it becomes um, a source of pride, I think, for a lot of people. You know, like uh, most landlords, maybe most is the wrong word, a lot of landlords that I know, their self-worth is tied into their net worth and their, their property, you know? So they want to ride around and say, well, I own this one, I own that one. And they like the sticks and bricks and the, the feeling of the material that this is real and I own it. Where, like for me, I look at that and say like, oh yeah, that, all that stuff can break, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? I'd really, and, and I've said oftentimes, if everything that I owned fit in a file cabinet, I would be 100% happy with that. It's like, here's my note, here's my deed of trust, here's my mortgages, you know, and uh, all of that. But then the property at some point becomes a frustration. Okay. And then oftentimes the, the emotion attached with this is frustration and anger because they think this person has hosed me, this tenant has hosed me. And now what I was hoping this asset is, it'll never, it's never going to be. Mm -hmm. And so they just want to cut ties because it, I think it's in, in part an identity issue. What this property is shows me what I didn't do well. And I can't handle that. Mm -hmm. I don't want to be around. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I'm just thinking about, I'm just thinking about that house I'm, uh, I got right down the street. Oh yeah. It was a tired landlord. He owned quite a few houses in town. 
and he was getting a little bit older. Didn't want to keep, continue to take care of him, so he wanted to sell three. And I didn't even ask where the other two were at the time. But uh, I saw him hammering a for sale by owner sign in his front yard and just pulled over. Yeah. And walked up and said, so why don't you tell me a little bit about the house and what you have going on? And and went through the triage right there, found out everything, they, and wound up uh, giving him one he wanted, wound up, the least he would take was one, 170. Found out, met the owners the next week, I mean, met the tenants the next week, found out they were about six months away. They'd been in it three and a half, four years. They're about six months away from getting the credit restored. I got proof of that. Hmm. And uh, rented to them for like nine months. They refinanced and sold it at 245 Boom. Yeah. And I told them, I said, you know, if, if, I, if you guys moved out, if I ask you to go ahead and move out, and I rehabbed it, about half rehabbed it, I yeah. could sell it in this neighborhood for like two eighty five. Yeah. So I I will come off of some of that equity there equity there. So you're not buying at the top of the market. And they were going to be my neighbor too. They were four houses down. Right. And so I felt good enough how that worked out. But it was just a tired landlord. So tired that just the first person that walked up to him, uh, you know, and said, Hey, won't you tell me what you got going on? the least he could take was plenty good for me. I tell you that that's one of the crazier deals. We've, we've got a lot of crazy, bunch of crazy deals. ones, a lot of crazy ones, but the fact like here's Tony driving all, along down the road and fixing to turn into my driveway about to turn into his house and sees this guy. And, and here's, and we talked about this in terms of belief. If Tony had the mindset and the lens that deals are tough to find, you can't find deals in this neighborhood. There's no chance that he would have stopped for that deal. Mm -hmm. But he just stopped and had a conversation mm -hmm. and did very, very well on the deal. And the fact that he sold, he bought the house from the landlord and sold it to the tenant is like yeah. the most fun thing. Yeah. And then the opposite happened. Steph and I showed up at the same uh, auction two weeks ago on the same street that I live on. And um, I had already, the day the guy showed up, the house had been abandoned, not abandoned, but had been locked up for 16 years. The son the mother would not let the son get in the house. Mm. He he mowed the grass for 16 years. She finally passed away. She left a note, told him where the key was. He got in for the first time. It was full of stuff, completely full to the ceiling. But it was his childhood memories, too. Yeah. So I, right there, I went right into it. Won't you tell me, you know, what you've got going on with the house? A little bit about it. And... Uh, just walked right into the triage. And at that point, he would have, the, the least he would have taken was 100. And uh, it would have sold if it were cleaned up, and cleaned out, cleaned up, and painted, and some issues. Probably sold for about 250 at you know, that way. So I was fine with 100. Um, but uh, he had a relative who was uh, worked for an auction company. Mm -hmm. And he said, well, won't you just let me auction it off? You don't have to take it. And then you got this backup. You got a neighbor down there. Buy it from so uh, Steph and I showed up the same thing. It sold for 160. Okay. Which I was happy for. Him. Yeah, good. I mean, and, um, but those kinds of things, you just have to keep your antennas high. Yeah. And uh, Steph is crazy good at this. Oh, yeah. You know, how she comes up with her houses sometimes, I'm just, well, how'd you find that? Well, I, I just showed up at an auction over there and nobody else showed up. You know, but um, I do think you have to have some creativity about how you're going to look at things. You know, we've got our, you know, the way that we market, that's our mainstream. Correct. But you got to keep your antennas up. And it depends on what someone's trying to accomplish. You know, like somebody can do two, three, four, six deals a year without marketing. Mm -hmm. You just have to have the, the processes of understanding negotiation and deal structure to make that happen. You know, so, yeah. I mean, you're, you're doing 
probably six, eight, 10 deals a year, something like that, mm -hmm. just from network mm -hmm. and driving down the road and seeing seeing people put up for sale by owners. And, and I still old school uh, a couple nights a week. I'll look on Craigslist. Yeah. Then your first deal, I remember uh, uh, how me and Tony got, got teamed up together years ago. Uh, we'd known each other from Starbucks forever. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and uh, I was going around the line there and you were at the table and you said, Brad, you do something with real estate, don't you? Tell me what you think about this house. It's pre foreclosure. And he started going through it. I was like, oh man, we can buy this sub two, you know, everything. <laughs> and, <laughs> and Tony ended up buying it and selling it and did well. But uh, that, that's kind of how it started, you know, yeah. from a deal on Craigslist. And at that point, you know, I was like, yeah, I think he might know more than I do because I didn't know nothing. You know, and, and you even, you knew words I didn't know, you know? So, um, I mean, if, if you're, if you get a good mentor and, um, I think right now I, I'm 61 years old and I think if you are over 50 right now, I would encourage you to get a mentor that's much younger than you. Interesting. I'm not saying give away your other mentors. I'm just saying that the way that the fast pace that the world is moving and the way that technology has basically is our new communication, not new in number of years, but when you look at a broader swap, you're going to see it's new in a number of years. And those of us who were not raised on technology, who are abacus first graders, <laughs> Uh, I would tell uh, you know I know I know <laughs> I would tell you to get you one of your mentors needs to be half your age, needs to be under forty five. I was going to say if if they're trying to get in the business and they're nineteen, maybe there's uh, yeah you don't get the ten year old to help you, but yeah uh, maybe hey and guys by the way we're on TikTok now. Uh, we're considering hiring a ten year old to help us with our videos because we're so bad at them. Yeah. And uh, I know Tasha has a daughter that uh, seriously may be helping with us, yeah. with us with some TikToks. We're moving offices. We're going to have uh, a room for the the kids to to hang out in, you know, and a, a little nursery area mm -hmm. too. And then we've got an area for a gym. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to make a big order from Rogue. So we're, we're going to be the fittest company and we're going to have some kids uh -huh. there hanging out. It's going to be like daddy daycare uh, at the office. It's going to be great. But all that to say, Harper may be helping us with the kids and then she can help help us with what we're lovingly referred to as tickies. Mm -hmm. Tickies are the videos that we're creating for the TikTok. Back right quick. How old were you eight years ago? Gosh, all that math, dude. Uh, 28. So you, you became a, my real estate investment mentor at 28. And I was 53. Yeah. But, you know, it's so funny. So I just turned 36 two weeks ago. And uh, Miss Christina, is there, is there a thought? Uh, no, I'm just she, she's looking about at how many like, young people. I looked at our group picture yeah. yesterday. Kara goes, oh, man, your team looks great. And, 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 <laughs> and then I said, do you see anything out of, it looks like it's out of place. She goes, yeah, the guy, it's supposed to be at Adam's place. How did he get loose right there? She was talking about me. But it is the case. Go ahead. What were you saying? I have no idea. Well, I, I just think, I think it's so important for anybody that's older. Uh, get, one of your mentors needs to be probably half your age, you know, but somewhere between 20 and 45. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the world is moving quickly. Yes. And, um, you know, it's, I hate technology really. And everybody here knows this. I usually throw one piece of technology away in the trash per week. Uh, it keeps getting rescued though. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure how that it happens. recycles. Yeah. So, um, anyway, uh, guys, I, I think that's probably it for us today. It's a little bit short, but tired landlords, it's just one of those things that we don't run into it as much as the other big five. It's often coupled with one of the other big motivators, and, but we do want you to be cognizant of it. And so yeah. understanding that some of your best term deals will come from the tired landlord group because they're open to receiving payments anyway. It's what they were hoping for in the past. Understanding what the house is, is going to be important with all the big five. You know, understanding what the house means to them and then the emotions behind people's motivation is going to help you navigate uh, these situations in a better way, help you to buy more houses and also serve people at a higher level, which is what we're trying to do. Mm -hmm. So I uh, want you guys to, to understand that. Um, check us out on the Tiki. I don't know what the, the handle is called, but I'm sure if you search my name, it'll come up there somewhere. Yeah. Uh, we have amazing content. 
Uh, Tony's going to be doing some dances for the Tiki here soon. Oh, is that right? Yeah, you're going to be doing some dances. Christina Watch here is going to be doing some, some dances and, and all, all kinds of stuff. Uh, might even point to something on the screen. All right. You know, uh, that's that's where I draw the line. I might point to something. I'm not dancing. You're not going to dance? Hell no. I ain't dancing. I'm, I'm going to break it down out there one day. You're going to do the mashed potato? I'm talking about my hip right here. Break it down. <laughs> well, we <laughs> hope that doesn't happen. Well, let's not break anything. So that'll be good. All right, guys, we're going to call it a day. We'll see you next Tuesday, TMC. See you next time. All right.